it's a real pleasure to be here to talk to this kind of group because um, I, I like the kind of project you're, you're part of and I think it's very special to be able to be linked up to Global Connect, special for you and special for me. Um, what I'm going to be talking about is the, some ideas from my most recent book, China in the 21st Century, What Everyone Needs to Know, which is about to come out in a new edition. It came out in 2010. And now it's just being updated with help from um, Mara Cunningham, a graduate student at UCI. And she was the editor of the blog um, China Beat that we started at UCI, which has now been wound down. It still exists as a Twitter feed, if any of you are on Twitter. If any of you are on Twitter, you can follow me at Jay Wassers. Um, I tweet quite regularly, and I tweet not about what sandwich I'm eating or where I'm going to have fun, but usually I tweet links to things about China I think are worth reading, or about other parts of the world that are also worth reading. Uh, China in the 21st Century, What Everyone Needs to Know, is a set of answers to commonly asked questions about China, the goal of which is to try to get beyond the soundbite-driven uh, views of China that you get from being a casual consumer of mass media to try to get at some of the complexities of the country and ambiguities and contradictions. Um, very much, I'm sure, the kind of thing that you're dealing with in different parts of the world in a class like this. Uh, so what I thought I would do is um, mention just a little bit about the cover of the book, which fortunately I didn't need to change when going to the updated edition because the basic idea of it still fits. Um, in Communist Party-run countries in the past, there was a presumption that the cultural uh, life within those countries would also be out of step with the rest of the world, as well as their political systems being distinctive. And when I first got to China in the mid-1980s, that was very true of China. Um, I had grown up in the United States in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, when the United States was seen as going on one track and Communist Party run parts of the world were going on another during the Cold War. And when I got to China in the mid-1980s, I found a place where daily life was radically different from anything that I'd um, experienced. It was different in ways that were good and bad, I think. People in China tended to live in very similar material conditions to one another. There was much more equality in China than there was in the United States in terms of lifestyles. Um, if, if you were in a very powerful, relatively powerful position, the very top elite lived a special life, privileged life there. But other than that, most people, um, you know, the head, of a, the head of a factory wouldn't have that much more space to live in than a worker in the factory. It was a very egalitarian place in a lot of ways. It was also one in which there was actually much more equality in some ways between men and women than in the United States in some kinds of things. When I went to a Shanghai University in the mid-1980s, the president of that university was a woman. And at that point, uh, this was the second best university in China. In that point of view, none of the major, major universities in the United States were headed by a woman, I'm pretty sure. So there were some ways uh, my wife, um, went with me then and said that it was, it was wonderful for her to live in a uh, country for a time where there weren't big billboards up objectifying women's bodies to sell products. Um, in China, that wasn't it. If there was a billboard up that, that, um, that referred to the differences between men and women, it was largely to say women have all the same rights as, as men. Um, there were problems with China in the mid-1980s that made me very glad when I got back to the United States. There was a lot more freedom of speech here, freedom of the press, things like that. And it was a lot more fun to live in the United States for somebody with my tastes and attitudes. In China, there were very few places to go out to eat. There were only about, in Shanghai, there were only about five independently run restaurants. Um, other than that, it was kind of like cafeteria foods of different sorts. and. Um, and so in, you know, in the United States, you would choose what kind of cuisine you went out for. In China, you had very limited choices. There was only one Hollywood movie that played in China the whole time we were there uh, for a year. Television was so boring um, that once a week, there was a half hour Disney cartoon shown of um, Mi Lao Shu and Tang Lao Ya, Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck in Chinese. 
And we would watch that because we were so starved for anything kind of entertaining. entertaining. And we found out that our Chinese friends in college were watching that half hour of Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck too because they were so starved for entertainment. So you go there and then so th this sort of fit with this idea of a China that was out of step culturally with global trends. I made some very good friends there, people who like me were in their 20s when I got there. But um, we became friends in spite of the fact we'd grown up sharing none of the same kinds of ways to have fun. They hadn't seen any of the same movies or television shows as me. They hadn't listened to any of the same music with, with a couple of exceptions. Um, they just, we hadn't played the same games. So when you flash forward from that period in the mid-1980s to the present, you find that the political disjuncture between the United States and China is still there. China is still run by a Communist Party uh, state that some of the, the control of the media is still there. But the other things I've said have largely disappeared. China is no longer a more egalitarian place than the United States. The divide between rich and poor, between haves and have-nots, is as big in China as it is here. There's been this economic boom that has led to some people getting very, very rich and some people um, being left behind. So in that way, it's much like the United States. Gone is the kind of uh, difference in more kind of egalitarianism between the sexes in various ways. In China, you'll see plenty of billboards now objectifying women's bodies to sell products. And in some ways, China, because it hasn't developed some of the protections over time that capitalism has developed in the US to protect um, against sexual discrimination, there are some ways in which China feels like going back to America in the 1950s to a less enlightened time when it comes to male-female differences in uh, advertisements for certain kinds of jobs. Um, now, you can have ads in China that you would be banned from having in the United States as sexual discrimination. They can be ads uh, that say, we want a woman for this job who must be at least five foot two and, must, and cannot weigh over such and such amount. We want them to have a good body. You know, this you cannot say in an American uh, job ad now. But in China, you can, because China has embraced capitalism without or consumerism without adopting some of the overtime protections that have come in. So this is a long way of saying the, the cover of this book is flags that in this book, as in a lot of things that I've written and think about, I'm trying to make sense of how China could have changed so much for better and for worse in the kind of um, personal life and cultural stage and consumerism while staying the same and so out of step with us in political terms. And so the top picture shows um, some youth at a punk rock concert in the early 21st century. Punk rock was the kind of thing the Communist Party states would just abhor in the, the Cold War. You wouldn't want this kind of you know, wild music and things. But now in China, you can, you can have that. And the picture below shows what hasn't changed in China um, with the kind of political system. And I mentioned at the beginning that when I got to China in my 20s, um, I met people who had, had none of, grown up with none of the same experiences. My kids are now that age. And if they went to China and met Chinese of their, in their early 20s, they would find people who had shared an incredible number of the same experiences growing up in China in the last 20 years or so. My kids grew up reading Harry Potter books. Chinese kids of their age grew up reading Harry Potter books. Love the Lord of the Rings movies. The Chinese youth largely know those, especially in the cities, know those same things. Grow up playing World of Warcraft, ditto. Watching some of the same films, watching some of, a lot of the same videos, listening to some of the same music. So there's this kind of way in which popular culture and youth culture have merged, merged together while parts of the political system have stayed so far apart. So that's one of the things that um, the book explores. When I updated the book from 2010 to 2013, one thing I didn't have to change was the cover. I had to include a lot of things that have happened. The last few years have been very eventful, and so there were a lot of new questions and new answers that need to come in. But the basic, this is a picture of the Communist Party leaders, uh, the newest crop of them, and they look a lot like the last crop of them in different ways. And so um, I didn't have to change the cover at all, except I changed the we changed the color from um, orange to red as the background. But that basic contrast between a kind of popular culture, consumer culture that's getting more and more in convergence with America, 
but uh, a political system that stayed uh, distinctive and different has, has stayed that we can do that. Uh, this is the new leader, Xi Jinping. And here are five things that, since I can't tell you everything you need to know about China, or even close to that, in um, one session, I thought I would tell you five things that I think it's useful for everyone uh, to know about China. And so I'll go through each of these individually. The one that I realize is a kind of dated reference um, that I want to update generationally is when I say China can be like 1984 and like Brave New World. Um, when I was growing up, 1984 and Brave New World were the two, were two books that you generally had to read in school that described two visions of how dictatorships work or could work, or how masses of people can be kept in line by a small group of people. 1984 by George Orwell was often seen as the key to understanding Communist Party states. In 1984, there's a figure called Big Brother who has surveillance cameras everywhere that keep track of what everybody's doing. In 1984, the system of rule is what Orwell described as the boot on the face over and over again. You're kept down by fear that if you step out of line, the state will crush you. In Brave New World, on the other hand, it was a, it was a vision of a world in which people remain apolitical and the authorities can stay in control because the state satisfies your every desire. It keeps you happily distracted with consumer goods, with spectacles, um, that you're watching things that are incredibly engrossing and they keep you from talking about or caring about politics. So in 1984, Big Brother's watching you. In Brave New World, you're watching Big Brother or other kinds of reality shows that are distracting. One of the ways to update this would be to say that in a lot of recent visions of dystopian futures, they actually take a piece of 1984 and a piece of Brave New World and combine an aspect of a world that's controlled through, um, through fear and a world that's controlled through spectrum. So for example, if you've seen The Matrix, how many of you have seen The Matrix? Okay. In The Matrix, when you're believing that the world of the surface is what the real world is, that's Brave New World kind of control. When you see what's underneath the surface, when you take the pill of the other color, sorry, spoiler alert, there's a pill of a different color, those of you who haven't seen it, then you realize that it's actually a kind of 1984 system where there's control by force. Another example would be the Hunger Games. The world in Katniss's own um, village, where there's a lot of the control by the state, that's a kind of a lot of elements of the 1984 rule by control, but the Hunger Games itself, the spectacle that everybody's wrapped up in watching that is distracting and entertaining, that's a kind of Brave New World kind of element. Now, in fact, you know, there, there are elements of these two forms of control, the kind of fear of the state and bread and circuses distraction in many systems, but what I want to get at is in much of the coverage of China, it will only talk, it will talk about China as an Orwellian state sometimes or a state state control. And I think it's important to realize that the way the Communist Party stays in control now is only partly through fear. It's also in control partly because it's delivering the goods to a lot of people, providing them with more ways to be distracted, entertained, and more stuff to buy. 1984 has often been seen as the key work criticizing Communist Party run stays. Brave New World has often been seen as the great literary work that criticizes capitalist consumer states as a critique of capitalism and consumption. China is now um, elements of both rather than one or the other. So Brave New World versus 1984. There are some aspects of life in China. There's still the boot on the face, the riot police kind of image there. But there are others that are more the Brave New World society of the spectacle giant billboards and including giant video screens with entertaining things as you're walking around a city. In China, there's so much to look at. Whether the state's watching you or not sometimes seems less important than whether uh, what you're watching keeps you distracted. Another key part of um, the 1984 scenario Orwell described is the state wanted complete control, not just of what you did, but what you thought. 
the state wanted you, if we say 2 plus 2 equals 5, you have to believe that 2 plus 2 equals 5. That was its measure of control. In China, there are some aspects in which the state still wants to convince people of things that are patently untrue. The state denies that there was a big massacre in 1989 that killed a lot of protesters, students and workers who gathered in central Beijing <coughs> in, in events that are associated with Tiananmen Square. Even though the killings didn't take place in Tiananmen Square, they took place around there. Tiananmen Square has the kind of meaning for 1989 and for China as Tahrir Square for Egypt with the Arab Spring. The difference is whereas Tahrir Square protests led to a change of government in, in, in Egypt, Tiananmen led not to a change in China but led to the state reasserting its control and denying that anything of importance had happened then at Tiananmen Square. So the state will still tell you that nothing happened then. That's their 2 plus 2 equals 5. So Huxley in Brave New World is what might be called soft authoritarianism, kind of control through um, economic prosperity, consumerism, um, and a kind of light touch by the state. That's associated now with countries largely that are not communist. Singapore has a kind of soft authoritarianism like that. Saudi Arabia has a kind of soft authoritarianism like that. The hard authoritarianism of Orwell's 1984 we associate with a place like North Korea where there's a kind of forced conformity, uh, complete crackdown on any kind of free speech, even in privacy, even in kind of um, in, in subtle critiques the government can get you in a lot of trouble. China is a blend between those two. There's still moments of boot on the face. Some kinds, of, some kinds of activities will lead to a crackdown. You won't have a knock on the door if you tell a joke about the government and the privacy of your own home the way you would in Orwell's 1984 and some periods of the Chinese past. Chinese individually will tell plenty of political jokes at home. There won't be the knock on the door. But organize a movement that challenges the state and you will have the boot on the face kind of thing. Occasionally, you will still get the state trying to convince you that 2 plus 2 equals 5, as with the Tiananmen event, which is parodied here in a Simpsons episode. Screenshot from there. But a lot of what goes on in China now, what keeps people from rising up, is they're too busy doing stuff. They're too busy with things to buy, things to entertain them, um, things to keep them happily distracted than to rise up at the, against the state. So it's as much a society of the spectacle and consumption as it is um, a society of mass conformity, more than a society of mass conformity and, um, and control. You know, this is a shot of China in Mao's era in the 1960s at a mass rally where everybody's dressed identically, reading the same book on the same page. And you can just think about how far removed that is from the kind of shot on the cover of the book of um, youth going to a punk rock concert dressed totally different. Here you would be dressed identically to your parents. You would be reading the same book as your parents. Now in China, different generations are on completely different um, pages in almost every kind of way. Um, the 1984 versus Brave New World, there's a kind of mashup of those systems of control in many parts of China. But in some parts of China, it's still a one way to think of the variation. Some parts of China is still much more tightly controlled, like Tibet. It's still, there are moments when, there are many more moments there where there's this complete kind of in your face state like 1984. Um, in places like Beijing and Shanghai, it's a mix of the two. In places like Hong Kong, which is now part of the People's Republic of China, you in fact have much more Brave New World and very little of 1984. And one sign of that is that in Hong Kong, you can actually carry a posters to the street that mock the government for being too much like 1984. This is one when there was a new regime, when there was a new effort to put through a new curriculum for Hong Kong schools that would teach the official version of the Chinese past that Beijing wanted. Students protest on the streets with um, posters like this, we don't need no thought control, and they actually got the government to back down and alter its, um, and not in introduce that kind of new curriculum. So China, there are 1984 parts and Brave New World parts and mashup parts.
And there are moments when the government reasserts. There's sort of 1984 moments, but I think there's more of a kind of brave new world period in China now. Be wary of either or choices about China. This is the second point I wanted you to have to take away. And I've already given you one example of an either or. Is China 1984 or a brave new world? No, it's a, it's a mashup of both. And I think there are other ways in which the way to think about China is as a little of both. And the thing I use to illustrate this is an old Chinese menu, which when I was growing up, I didn't know much about China. But one thing I knew was that Chinese restaurants had a different way of ordering and a different way of eating than the standard American restaurant then, which were less ethnic restaurants in America. You tended to go to a typical restaurant. You would have to choose either a beef dish or a chicken dish. You'd order a hamburger. You'd order fried chicken. When you went to a Chinese restaurant, it was different, a sense of difference, which was that you would order one from column A and one from column B. You might order a chicken dish and a beef dish, or you know, a chicken and You would make a make your meal by drawing elements from different categories. And this is what I wish more of the coverage of China. There's great coverage of China by journalists that I really like and admire. I'd be happy to tell you who I like to read. But when China stories get boiled down to like bare essentials in sound bites or in um, headlines, it's often as though, will China be X or Y, rather than China will be a bit of X and a bit of Y? Or is a Chinese leader X or Y? Is the new Chinese leader going to be a reformer who's going to liberalize China in every way, or a conservative who will block liberalization in every way, when in fact they're likely to be a bit of both. And so I give some examples of um, debates where there's a chicken or beef choice in the way it's framed, but you actually should say this person's going to order from both sides of the menu, like or is ordering from both sides of the menu. So a discussion of Xi Jinping, will he be the new Chinese leader, just, just installed as president? In November, he was installed as head of the Communist Party. Now he's got both those roles. Took over from Hu Jintao, who is typed as having been a fairly conservative figure who didn't liberalize China. Deng Xiaoping, who was China's leader in the 1980s, is often typed as a reformer who liberalized China. So Nicholas Kristof, who used to cover China for the New York Times and still is an influential columnist and writes some very good stuff, but also I think occasionally falls into some misleading traps, he posed the question in one of his columns, will Xi Jinping be a reformer like Deng Xiaoping was, or will he be a conservative like Hu Jintao was? And I think that's the wrong way to put it. He says, I'm, I'm hopeful that Xi Jinping will be a, re will be a reformer. I think it's very likely Xi Jinping will be ordering from both sides of the reform and conservative menu, just like Deng Xiaoping, who's shown here, did. This is an image of Deng Xiaoping from a Hong Kong wax museum, which shows what for China is considered um, one of Margaret Thatcher, who just died, uh, most important moments was when Margaret Thatcher and Deng Xiaoping met, in the, um, met and decided that Hong Kong would go from being British controlled back to being Chinese controlled or to being Chinese controlled in 1997. But Deng Xiaoping, whose name is associated with reform, actually chose from both, ordered from both the conservative and reform side of the menu. He opened up China's economy, liberalized it, but he held the line on political change. He set in motion the move toward a China that was more in step culturally and economically, but still not in step politically. With our, with our system. So he was, even though he's associated with the forum, he did some things that were reformist, some things that were conservative, and I think Xi Jinping will be the same. Another kind of false divide between two categories when we should actually think of people moving between the categories or doing mix and match mashups has to do with the idea of the dissident and the loyalist. The most famous creative figure in China now and arguably the most famous artist in the world, living artist, is Ai Weiwei over on the right there. Um, he, was, he was an establishment artist. He was one of the people who was helping design the Bird's Nest Stadium for the uh, Olympic Games in 2008. And then he became very disaffected by the government, the things the government was doing, and became more and more of an outspoken critic of the government until the government um, the authorities arrested him and beat him up and then held him um, on trumped up tax evasion charges, or we think trumped up tax evasion charges for a while. And he's been a continual thorn in the side of the government 
and he's be, he stayed outspoken against the government. He's a kind of classic dissident figure who were used to thinking of these figures in Communist Party run states. People who challenge the government and end up pushed into exile or in prison or under house arrest. The other famous dissident would be Liu Xiaobo, who won the Nobel Peace Prize uh, a couple of years ago. The Chinese government was very angry about that. He had done an online petition uh, called Charter 08 that was calling for uh, the introduction of um, rapid political liberalization in China. The government didn't like the statements in the, the char in the charter. And they didn't like that it seemed to be generating a movement by circulating online. So they sent him to 11 years in prison just for something he wrote. So he's an he's admirable dissident figure. He fits in, both of them fit in this category of people who challenge the state, and the state responds in often quite brutal ways to them. The other figure on there is Zhang Yimou, a filmmaker who made a series of especially in the 1980s and early 90s, made some really good movies, uh, including To Live and some others that I like. Um, but over time has evolved into largely a spokesman for the government or creating mass spectacles that serve the state. He choreographed the, the 2008 opening ceremonies, the Olympics, and he also choreographed um, a big parade marking the 60th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. So, both of them, so Ai Weiwei has drifted more and more into this kind of classic dissident stance. Zhang Yimo has drifted more and more into this kind of spokesman for the regime stance. And so when a new figure captures the Western imagination, the, one of the questions say is, which is this person? Is he like Ai Weiwei or she? Or like Zhang Yimo? In fact, uh, often there'll be in between figures who, who order from the oppositional and loyalist side of the menu, to go back to my metaphor. And examples of this include Mo Yan in the bottom right corner, who recently won the Nobel Prize for Literature, and Hu Hua, who's one of my favorite writers up on um, the other side, who wrote a book called China in 10 Words, whose cover is shown there. Um, neither of these people are outright dissidents. Neither of them are in prison or pushed into exile. But neither of them are complete spokesmen for the regime in this kind of uncritical way that Zhang Yimou is when he organizes these state rituals. Both of them write novels that have critiques uh, that sort of make fun of corrupt local officials um, and have other kinds of jibes at problems with society that probably wouldn't be able to be written and published in a kind of classic 1984 state. So it show they can only operate this way because some things about the literary system in China and cultural system have loosened up. And yet, they have, they, they're not in a direct oppositional state to the government. They're people who order off both sides of the menu in, in different ways. Mo Yan, I think, does it in less interesting ways than Hu Hua and in safer ways and less courageous ways. So Mo Yan is very careful that when he, he satirizes things about the current situation, he satirizes things that the government thinks are OK to satirize, like local officials, but never criticizing national officials. And when he makes public statements, he's very cautious, uh, even when he's in the West, um, to say things that won't, won't offend the government too much. So he's more like the official spokesman. He's a, member, he's a vice chairman of the Official Writers Association. But he's, but he's not completely, his, in, his, in his art, he's still fairly independent, unlike Zhang Yimou increasingly. And he doesn't avoid all political topics. But he makes some thing, choices that I think are, are, are kind of unconscionably safe. For example, when he was in um, Norway and he was asked about, or Sweden, he was asked about censorship in China. Is it hard to be an artist under censorship? He said, no, it's not really that bad. It's kind of like a hassle, but not a big deal. Um, it's like going through airport security. You know, you'd rather not, but you kind of understand why they do it. <coughs> Yu Hua, on the other hand, is a member of the Official Writers Association, but he takes riskier choices. He would never say something like that about censorship. Certainly in the West, he talks about how, how what a pain it is to deal with censorship and how he, he thinks that uh, the censors go far too, too far in kind of trying to limit what's good for people to consume and things like that. Um, and Yu Hua, he writes some novels that can be published in China to reach this main audience there, 
and it makes subtle critiques of the system. But sometimes he gets fed up with doing that kind of subtlety and he wants to directly criticize the system. And then he writes things that can only be published in the West or Taiwan and that drift back into China in underground editions. So here's an example of what um, Hugh Hua talks about. It also gives you an example of some of the ways censorship and ways around it work in China. Um, you're not allowed to say in, on the Chinese mainland that there was a massacre in 1989 and um, that many people were killed. Um, the way the government censors that is they censor the use of the date that's associated with the massacre, which is June 4th. So you're not allowed to say, especially around the anniversary of June 4th, you can't say, let's remember what happened on June 4th. Because everybody knows that's a code word for 1989. So the word 6-4, the shorthand for, for June 4th, are banned then. So what some bloggers started doing until the censors caught up was saying, Let's remember the terrible violence of May 35th. Okay, it takes a little while to get that. But it took a while for the censors to do it. And meanwhile, there could be all these things about remembering the made-up date of May 35th, which is obviously June 4th. So Hugh Hua says sometimes that he doesn't mind doing workarounds that only some people will get. So he can write his novels and he can include subtle, um, subtle critiques. That's pulling a May 35th. But sometimes he just wants to say what he thinks and he wants to pull a June 4th. And then he writes things that are published outside. So I want to get to a third point, which is there's no single PRC internet story, People's Republic of China internet story. Even though I've mentioned about censorship already, when I brought up the web, I brought up censorship. Um, that's not the only thing going on in China, the internet. Though you might think so if you read only the news about China on the internet. You might think it's only about that the only thing that's, that's a big news story about China and the internet are either censorship of control of news in China or maybe hacking by Chinese hackers of the uh, um, foreign companies and countries. But actually, the story of the internet in China, and China has more internet users than any other country on earth, the story of the internet is a complex one with a lot of different sides to it. And a lot of what people are doing on the internet has nothing to do with censorship or with hacking. It can ha and it also isn't only about the only one other thing you'll sometimes hear about the internet in China is the t tension and competition between Chinese companies and American companies, a kind of economic story. Will Facebook be allowed in China? It's blocked there now. Will YouTube be allowed in China? It's blocked there now. And that's partly a political story. It said, you know, maybe YouTube's blocked because the government can't control um, the content of YouTube videos. Maybe it's also controlled because of an economic story of China wants Yoku, a uh, Chinese company that's like YouTube, to get viewership and um, economic stake. But actually, there's more to the Chinese internet story than either censorship or competition between Chinese and American uh, businesses. And I'll give you some examples of this. This is a shot of a Chinese internet cafe. I go to Chinese internet cafes when I'm in China to see what people are doing there. A lot of people, some people have home computers or increasingly access the internet um, from smartphones. But there's also plenty of people who use internet cafes who don't have their own computer but go to internet cafes to use the web. And when you go into an internet cafe, I mean, one of the things I'm interested in is are people kind of, you can, find workarounds to access news that's banned in China by tricking a computer into thinking it's uh, using a virtual proxy network that tricks your computer into thinking you're logging on from outside of China. And actually, you can use a virtual proxy network to trick your computer into thinking you're accessing inside of China. So you can find out what's being censored uh, from the outside. But usually in China, you can get around it to see things, see sites that are blocked in China. But most people in most internet cafes aren't even trying to do that. Yeah, and the government sometimes cracks down on But most people aren't doing that. Most people in Chinese internet cafes aren't reading the news. Most people in Chinese internet cafes, like most people using the internet most of the time, most everywhere, are not using the internet to have it do anything political. They're trying to figure out where they want to go to eat. I said, you know, in Shanghai there were only five privately run restaurants when I was first there. Now there are 50,000. So you're going on the equivalent of Yelp, except China actually has a better equivalent of Yelp. It's more constantly updated by more people. So you can actually find out which dish is good that night and which part of the restaurant seems to have lousy service that night or the other. 
So people are logging on. So it's actually a story of the internet. is isn't just a story of things that China doesn't have that we have. Some of it is things that China has that are better than what we have. Twitter is banned in China, but there's a Twitter-like service, Weibo, that is used very much like Twitter, but is actually better than Twitter in a certain way because you can actually have comments on a tweet that show up in things. And actually, Weibo is better than Twitter in another way because if you post in Chinese, you're limited to 140 characters, just like 140 letters in English. But you can actually say a whole mini essay in 140 Chinese characters because each character is a word. So Twitter in English just gets compri compressed a lot, but the equivalent in China is you can say more, more elegantly, and have comments, and easily integrate pictures. But most people are doing things like figuring out where they're going to eat, figuring out what movies are playing, stay keeping in touch with their friends, maybe thinking about who they're going to hook up with. Um, being entertained, playing first-person shooter games. And the, so these internet cafes are not just political spaces. They're entertainment and consumer spaces as well. And in addition to the story about how there's a China versus US company story, this is a screenshot of QQ, which is like Facebook. It's a Chinese counterpart to Facebook compete, competitor. And people use it for many of the same reasons. But I'd always heard that it's also sort of different from um, Facebook. And so I asked um, some high school students um, from a Washington, D.C. school who'd gone and spent a year in China on an exchange and come back. And one of them had written a uh, paper about uh, social media in China versus America. I said, so what exactly is different about QQ from Facebook? I've heard it's different, but what's different? They said, well, some people share different kinds of information than you would in America. I said, like what? So well, it's more common to put your salary on your QQ page than people do on their Facebook page. And I, I, that made sense to me. When I was in China in the 80s, people would ask me how much money I made in a way that you usually wouldn't be asked that in, in, in the US. And people's salaries were more similar then, so people didn't think it was a big deal. Now, even though salaries are very different, I guess sort of the hob habit has stayed that you, you don't feel secretive about your salaries. OK, that makes sense to me. And I said, so like, what else? They said, well, everybody puts their blood type on their page. And now I said, not every China story is political. But my first thought was, this must be political. And the reason I thought about it, there was an AIDS blood scandal in China a little while ago where the government was blocking um, information about tainted blood going into the blood supply in one part. So with um, people were worried about getting AIDS through blood transfusions. So I thought, OK, so through so your social network, Maybe what you're trying to do is have a sense of who in your friend group has the same blood type. So if you ever need a blood transfusion because of this political lack of in the system, you can know who to go to. He said, you were so wrong. So this was an example of thinking politically when there was absolutely nothing political about it. The reason why you put your blood type on your QQ page is because in China, following on a trend that started in Japan and Korea, South Korea, there's this whole mystique about blood types being linked to personality types. So that somebody who's A, B is different uh, than somebody who's O. And so the idea is that actually, if you're trying to figure out who you might be compatible with to date, or what kind of, whether you like spicy food or not, all kinds of things are seen as being somehow linked to your blood type. The way that for Americans of my generation, at least, we all knew what our sign of the zodiac was. Whether we believed in it or not, there was this whole elaborate mystique about what Capricorns were like versus what Tauruses were like and whether they'd be compatible or not. So in, throughout East Asia, young people um, especially know which blood type they are for this kind of personality reason. And in fact, if, I've been told if you log on to Facebook in South Korea, it comes up with a prompt saying, would you like to add your blood type? On Japanese baseball cards, they list the player's blood type. And there are even guides to Tokyo, like enjoying Tokyo if you're AB positive, because these are the kinds of parts of the city you'll like best. Things like that. So this is a whole cultural and different parts of the world story that's different from what you would get in many of the soundbite-driven views of, of the internet story. I also happened to be in India when a story broke that alerted me to another way that the internet can be so interesting and complicated. China had just put out a competitor to Google Earth. And the story in the American press was 
the rivalry between a big American company and the Chinese state, because Google had problems with China before. So it was a kind of economic story there. But in India, it was actually treated as a political story, but not a political story like censorship, a political story like tensions between neighbors. Because in the Chinese counterpart to Google uh, Earth, they would show parts of India that China claims should be part of China as being part of China. And so this is another way in which the stories of the internet can be different around the world. Google, um, so China internet, China launches map world, it's Google Earth competitor. So that was one way in which the American news media was covering the story. But soon there was mention of the fact that Google being Google and being very clever was coming up with different versions of Google Earth. So if you logged on from India, it would show those parts of India as part of India. If you logged on from a Chinese speaking part of the world, it would show them as part of China. <clears throat> the fourth thing to note, and probably the most important thing um, that I'll get across in this if I can, is that modernization is not the same kind of question related to China as it used to be. In around 1978, when I first started paying attention to China and when China was just moving out of its period of, of Mao's rule and seemed to be heading on a different path, the big question was would China be able to modernize? And what was interesting was Deng Xiaoping um, was determined to modernize China. And he came out with this idea of the four modernizations that Zhou Enlai before him had had, but he was going to run with. That China needed to modernize its agriculture, industry, science, and defense. And he said we will modernize in a pragmatic way. One of his famous lines was, it doesn't matter if, it's, if, if you've got a rat problem, it doesn't matter if it's a white cat or a black cat you bring into the house. If it catches rats, it's a good cat. So he was saying, I don't care if it's, politically, if it's doctrinally correct with Marxism to do something or if it's something that might look a little bit like capitalism. If it helps us modernize, it will be a good thing. He said, I'll keep the political system what it is, but when it comes to the economy, I'll just use whatever works. And that involves modernizing in these four realms. Our goal is to make China, which has been held backwards, was seen as, as far less developed and modern than Japan. We're going to catch up. We're going to catch up with the West and with Japan in all these kind of metrics of modernization. We're going to have, we're going to have trains that aren't, aren't backwards seeming, cities that look fully modern, and things like that. What's interesting is back then, Americans were more concerned about a backward China than a competing China. So we were rooting for China to modernize, to succeed to modernize. And one reason for this is we looked to, that Americans were convinced, or many of them, that once countries modernize, the middle class grows, and the middle class wants more and more rights. And so if you modernize, then you democratize. So if we want China to democratize, we should hope for them to modernize, have their ec economy boom. Then they'll automatically liberalize and democratize. Uh, so when Deng Xiaoping came to America, a famous American said that, you know, welcoming you and we wish you and your people the best of luck on your new long march toward modernization in this century. So just think of this now, you know, that um, this was actually a famous American entertainer of the time who was playing for Deng Xiaoping on a state visit when Deng Xiaoping was mostly meeting with political leaders. Uh, but he also had, there was an entertainment side to it. But political leaders were saying the same kinds of things. Like, we're rooting for China to become a stronger, more economically vibrant country. Right now, that's not really what you're hearing American politicians saying. We're more worried about how economically developed and, and modern China is. Within China itself, critics of Deng Xiaoping also wanted China to modernize. They wanted their country to become strong. But they said China can't modernize unless it democratizes. This was a famous dissident who said that, would, that China needed a fifth modernization, democracy, or else its economy would be locked in place. So here you have it. Deng Xiaoping saying, we're going to modernize without democratizing and keep the political system say, the same with the economy booming. Americans saying, build your economy by all means, because then you'll automatically democratize. And dissidents saying, China needs to democratize or it can't boom. You flash forward to the present and China has boomed. It's got all those markers of modernity 
and yet it didn't need to democratize to do it, and it hasn't democratized since doing it. You have cities like Shanghai with more skyscrapers than New York City, taller ones. When I was there, the tallest buildings were mostly ones that dated from the 1920s and 30s. There'd been no new tall buildings, and the tallest buildings were only a third of the size of the tallest ones in New York. Now, um, now its skyscrapers outpace those of, of Manhattan. <coughs> there are giant video screens around the cities. The cities don't look drab and less modern than American ones, but at least the most developed ones look, look super modern. They have freeways that are more high tech than, than California ones and so forth. Uh, they have trains that are a marvel of the world and so forth. So now the question has become what are the costs of this breakneck modernization? Not will China be able to get strong, but how do we deal with this strong a China? And can the world survive that strong a China? The, econ the environment, the economy, and Chinese people are beginning to ask, what, not when, will, how will we be able to modernize, but what's the cost of our life of modernization? It used to be the government said, your life's getting, the economy's growing and booming, your life's getting better and better. Now people with health scares and safety scares are saying, we can buy more stuff, but are our lives really getting better? So here's a shot of, um, of Beijing on a particularly bad smog day in January in which you can still see the high-tech billboard, but you can't see much else. And the question is, is life getting better when your cities look this modern, but you can barely see them? And are you getting better when this is a play on the fact that there was recently big stories about thousands of dead pigs floating through um, uh, the rivers, a river near Shanghai? It came out the same time Life of Pi was coming out in the movie theaters. So in mockery on the web, they did a mashup of this kind of creativity pulling a, a May 35th of showing a mashup of Life of Pig, uh, both drawing attention to the pollution problem and safety problem at the same time playing on the new Hollywood film. So the last point I want to make is that China and the US often present themselves as radically different opposite countries. But in fact, the two countries have a lot in common with each other. Um, they're very different political systems, but in other ways, they're quite similar. And I can answer questions about how I think they're, they're similar in uh, various ways. But the biggest way they're similar, or I think the most important way to think of them, is that many of the things being said about China now in the US are actually kind of like things that were said about the US in Europe about 100 years ago, when we were the rapidly rising country that was playing by different rules. And people were wondering whether, even though we had we could clearly do some things in very modern ways, but were we ready for prime time? They weren't, the Europeans weren't sure. New rising powers often make established ones nervous. And there's some of the same complaints about China that you'll hear now in America you heard then from Europe. Charles Dickens came to America and said, oh, I love it that all my books are for sale here, but I'm not making a penny because they're all black market editions, pirate editions. The US was seen as not being good at playing by international copyright law. Just like now, China is seen as pirating all these movies and, and books. Charles Dickens' complaint is very similar to those of Hollywood films now. America was seen as a place that buildings went up incredibly fast, but were they safe? Same kinds of things you hear about China. Um, when I gave a version of this talk in Hong Kong recently, and I talked about their food safety scares every, every month, it seems, in China, because there isn't enough of a, a, of a system to make sure that, that food is healthy, and there are stories of, exp, of exploitation of labor, that she, this was a, a Chinese woman in the audience, a, a college student, she said it reminded her of a book she'd just read, The Jungle by Upton Sinclair, which talked about the unsafe conditions in American meatpacking plants about 100 years ago. So a lot of the similar, there are a lot of similarities to China then, and uh, between the United States then and China now. It was a country that the US was establishing, was, was generating a lot of excitement around the world, but also a lot of anxiety. We were hosting the biggest spectacles the world had ever seen. World's fairs, which were the big deal then that Olympics are now. When America hosted them, they were the first ones held out of Europe. They were bigger and higher tech than any of the world had ever seen. Just like when China finally got to host the Olympics in 2008, it was bigger and higher tech than the world had ever seen. When China finally got to host a World's Fair in 2010 in Shanghai, which I went to see, it was the biggest in the history of the world. So this idea of this kind of brashness and speed of development is something that was associated with the US then and China now. Not that the countries are totally the same by any means, but there are parallels that are worth keeping in mind for both countries. Um, 
this is, you know, American cities were once seen as the most futuristic places on Earth, and now uh, you saw Blade Runner was set in an LA of the future. Now sci-fi films are being set in Shanghai for the future. So I'd like to end with this slide that has something to do with that, um, which is a, a slide of the Expo, the World's Fair coming to Shanghai. And it's on a giant billboard. It, it brings together a lot of themes I brought up. China is now being a place of the society of the spectacle, giant billboard screens, videos that are like Times Square times 10. But this shot also has a kind of specific meaning to me after thinking of the anxieties that China is developing in the US. And I also, because I've talked a lot about popular culture and other things and said things that academic historians aren't really, you know, scholars don't necessarily do, I want to remind you of my scholarly credential by saying that when I look at this, it's kind of creepy actually, it's a giant baby coming at you through the screen. I like to think that it makes me think of a line from Homer. Simpson, who said, children are our future unless we stop them now. And I think that's how, ch how the US now is thinking increasingly about China. We used to say, when will it grow up? When will it grow up? And now we're thinking, how do we deal with another place that wants to be the biggest kid on the block? Thanks.